Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Station is ready for the event. KATU, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Jesse Satin with KATU. How do you hear me? We read you loud and clear, Jesse. Wonderful. Flight engineer Don Pettit, thank you Wonderful. so much for joining Flight us today in Portland, so Oregon. It's a pleasure to uh, be uh, uh, back in Oregon in a special way uh, via uh, radio waves and transmission. So I'm, I'm happy to think about uh, being back in a place that's near and dear to my heart. Now this is your fourth mission into space. What makes you want to keep going back? I think that's best said in the first line of a poem I wrote. Space is my mistress and she beckons my return. And then it goes on and on and on. But that, that's the <laughs> essence. It's, a, it's the essence of being human and exploring. And on this trip, you went up in a Russian Soyuz rocket. Can you talk a little bit about the international cooperation that goes into keeping the space station running? Uh, space station is built and operated by a whole bunch of countries. Uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, Canada, uh, Japan, and uh, Roscosmos from Russia. And it's amazing what you can do when you get a bunch of really creative and smart people all working together for a common goal. And the space station is the result of that. We are exploring space together in a way that would not be possible if we were doing it as individuals. And this mission includes numerous experiments and studies. Can you tell us about a few that really excite you? One of the most exciting experiments that I think that's happening here on Space Station right now. It's not something that we deal with inside. It's something that's mounted on the outside of station. It's a X-ray observatory. It's called NICER. It's orchestrated by folks from Goddard Space Center. And it is looking at pulsars and the timing of pulsars and the re it's kind of an esoteric thing it doesn't help feed and clothe people right now but the neat thing that they're working on is these uh cosmic pulsars off in the, our uh, galaxy have a timing that could be used as how we use our GPS satellite system here for navigation, not only within our solar system, but uh, outside of our solar system. So I think this is one of the most exciting concepts I've uh, heard about in a long time, using these astronomical uh, entities of pulsars as a, as a cosmic uh, GPS system for uh, navigation, uh, uh, for navigation uh, as we explore our universe. Amazing. Um, are there any smaller experiments you might be able to give us a demonstration of or show us any tools that you've helped create? Uh, I've got, uh, one of the things I like to do in my off-duty time is what I call science of opportunity. And I, I happen to have something here that I could demonstrate. I have been working with ice with uh, the freezing front on ice. And I want to show you one of my ice crystals that I've been working with. It's right here. Oops, look at that. Uh, because of the calm delay and stuff, I guess my ice crystal melted. Oh, well. Uh, uh, you can see, uh, uh, here's, 
here's here's what some of the crystals look like uh, under polarized light. So I'm I'm uh, 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 freezing and thawing these crystals, and and looking at the the uh, uh, front between the different crystals. But I I can show you something else here. I've got this long beaded chain, and you know these are the kinds of things that you see in pole lamps and things like that. Well, there's this effect dealing with inertia and momentum called the mold effect, and it re requires gravity. And I, I brought some beaded chain here just to see what would happen uh, with this mold effect. Can you duplicate it here in weightlessness, or, or is it something that requires gravity? And just messing around with these beaded chains, they, they seem to take on a mind of their own. And I've got a block of foam here. Let's see if I could do this. I'm going to rub it on my shirt, and that makes a small static charge. And let's see if I can. Oh, look at that. The, the chain is following the static charge. You would never be able to do this in, uh, uh, on Earth uh, because the, the static charges are small forces compared to gravity. So, so this is an example of some of the things that I could do in, in off-duty time here on Space Station. And, and again, I, I call this science of opportunity. It's, it means that you're here in this wonderful orbiting laboratory. You've got off-duty time. You've got simple things available to you that you can use for physics demonstrations. Uh, another thing that you've been doing from orbit is you're an accomplished photographer. You've captured many incredible images from orbit. Are you planning to continue your photography on this mission? And is there anything specific that you hope to capture? Uh, yes, I've, I have been continuing my photography. I did a little photography this morning during uh, uh, our off-duty time before work started, our work day started. And, and there's just all kinds of things that are amazing to see outside. One are cities at night on Earth, and, and they have changed uh, since the last time I was on station, which was t uh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago. Uh, the, the quality of the lights, their intensity, their color has all changed, uh, primarily switching to LED, a different signature than the sodium vapor and the mercury vapor lights that were dominant in uh, the 2012. So that's one observation. And then whatever happens to be there, comets, uh, we had a comet uh, called C 2023-A3. Uh, and this is uh, uh, a, a fairly bright comet that uh, you could see uh, before it approached the sun. And then after the sun, uh, we weren't able to see it because it uh, uh, our sunsets and sunrises are in the southern hemisphere. But anyway, uh, there's all kinds of things to see and photograph when you're up here that you can't necessarily see and or photograph on Earth. All right, you brought me to my next question. You mentioned the comet. You know, there's been some other incredible celestial events. We've been seeing the northern lights a lot. What is it like to view these types of phenomenon from space? And are there any studies that you're doing um, about them? Well, <clears throat> you could view all of these things from Earth. And we're, we're 240 miles above the surface of Earth. So what changes is uh, length scale and uh, in terms of what you can see. If you look at aurora with your feet on the ground, maybe you've got an event horizon of about uh, you have tens of kilometers. If you're in an airplane, maybe it's 100, 200 kilometers that you can see events. Uh, going on, natural phenomenology. When you are on orbit, our, our horizon is like 4,000 kilometers. So you can see these things on a different length scale. It's the same phenomenon, but you just look at it on a different length scale. And because of that, you can see and observe behaviors and or patterns uh, uh, that you wouldn't be able to see on a smaller length scale. 
many of the images that we see shared from the space station have Earth in the background in some way. Are there other views you're able to see from space station? Are you able to see the bands of our Milky Way, any of the other planets, the way that we do from Earth? Uh, yes. Uh, you can uh, you can point your camera in almost any direction you want, and you could uh, make it so you see no space station structure and no Earth. You're just looking at space, or you can make your camera look at Earth or the horizons of Earth. Uh, looking at Earth's horizon and our atmosphere on edge is truly a unique sight uh, that you can't do. Uh, from aerial photography or with your feet on the ground. And, and I tend to concentrate on the kinds of things you can see on the Earth limb. You can also point your camera uh, more zenith and you could look at Milky Way uh, structures. Although because of the orbital motion of space station, it's hard to get an exposure greater than one or two seconds without having the stars mm -hmm. blurry because of the motion. So it does limit our, uh, our uh, uh, imagery of deep space from space station. And do you have any advice for kids and adults here in the Northwest who are interested in broadening their exposure to space and science? Well, to get into space requires a rocket and to continue to live and work in space requires a spacecraft that has all these machines that keep you alive. They give you food, they give you water, they give you breathing mixture. You have all of this stuff required to live and work in a space environment. And you need to understand how this stuff works. And that takes math and science and engineering. And so what I tell students, if they want to come and do my job, uh, study these really cool subjects in school and at university, math, science, engineering, and then when you pop out on the other side of your education, you will find that, hey, I'm going to be qualified to apply to either a private astronaut program or NASA astronaut program, and I, then you could uh, uh, go down the road to become an astronaut. And earlier this month, a 13-year-old boy from here in the Portland, Oregon, accomplished a five-year goal of his. He made contact with an astronaut, it was uh, Sunita Williams, on the space station using a ham radio. How does it make you feel to know that there are kids and youth out here with that level of interest and drive to accomplish that type of goal? I think this is great to see people interested in some facet of science and technology and ham radio is one example and it may seem easy it's like 10-4 good buddy how's the space station going it, it it isn't that easy if you're a ham operator on the ground because station is moving so fast there are doppler shifts and it detunes the frequency that you can talk on and so you as a ham operator on earth have to compensate for the doppler shift of space station which means it's one direction when it's on the horizon coming towards you, zero Doppler shift when it's straight overhead, and then a Doppler shift the opposite direction when it's moving away from you. And, and a ham operator on the ground has to understand all of this and compensate with their ham radio. So to, to have kids in school interested in ham radio, it, it's more than just uh, keying a mic and, and saying, uh, Ted for good buddy, you got to understand a bit about a radio frequency and Doppler shift and, and all that jazz. So, so it's a good example of, of technology and engineering uh, coupled with the reward of talking to an astronaut via the ham radio. And before I ask my final question, I was wondering if you could give us a demonstration of floating in space. Okay, well, here's here's my beaded chain, so it's mm -hmm. it's obviously floating in space. And let me kind of step back here a little bit. And uh 
see if I could do some floating. This is our microgravity science glove box. Uh, and I see you could you could uh, uh, float and move around in space, kind of like Peter Pan flies around the room. But this is real because uh, uh, we've essentially nulled the effect, the local effect of gravity, because of our orbital motion. All right. All right. And now for my final question today. What do you hope to see accomplished in space exploration within your lifetime? Oh, wow. I, uh, what I hope the most is not specific uh, goals on the road to space exploration. You could say, well, moon, Mars, you know, and, and so on, Europa, whatever. What I hope to see is a continued effort in space exploration. What would break my heart would be if people decide, eh, we, we're done with space exploration, let's just uh, uh, sit at home and, and do things on Earth. Uh, what I hope is that space will continue to be explored in a consistent and stepwise manner internationally where we can work together with our international partners and produce something that individually would be uh, impossible to do. And that's, that's what I really hope happens with space exploration in my lifetime. Well, flight engineer Don Pettit, thank you so much for your time today. It was great talking with you. And it's great to uh, know that Oregon is still there. It hasn't run away. We orbit it every so often, and I could look down. Uh, I missed a really good pass where we were going to fly over Portland uh, the other day. And, uh, you know, I've got this day job. i got to work this timeline and, and do the science and the engineering and the maintenance of space station. And, and I was busy doing real work and couldn't go to the window to take pictures of Portland. But rest assured, I will be able to take pictures of Oregon, not only Portland, but, but all, the, all the other places that might be of interest. Crater Lake is beautiful from space. But anyway, I will get some pictures of Oregon, and it, it sings in my heart when I, when I see this from space. Thank you very much. Station, this is the Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you to all participants. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.